Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show today, we're going to discuss birds in your garden. They're important, and the reasons why you want to bring them in and how to do it, as well as perennial plants, those plants that you can plant once, vegetables as well as fruit, that will come back year after year and feed you for minimal amount of work on your end. And our guest, author of Composting for a New Generation, Michelle Ball, will be here discussing that and how we can compost better, as well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden Talk Radio is on the air in Milwaukee, and it starts right now. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5 in the city of Milwaukee and through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Wherever you may be, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is a website that we run that contains now 1,100-plus garden video, short and long format, as well as full-length in-studio video and podcast of this program, Season 1 and Season 2, as well as segments of this particular program on the Highlight tab and specific interviews. There's a number of ways in which you can contact us, and one being the 3-in-1 uh, organ- uh, Plant Guard Hotline by Ivory Organics. Ivy Organic 3 one Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you can visit ivyorganics.com, and you can call in any time during the show to 414-444-5250. As well as you can tweet us at hashtag TWVG, or you can uh, email us at TWVGshow at gmail.com, or you can text TWVG to 345345 to sign up for our weekly emails. Well, we want to welcome the guest. Uh, we were at uh, Cedarburg this past yeah, week. Yeah, we were at Cedarburg on Tuesday, or this past Tuesday. We had a good turnout there. We were talking about growing in straw bales. We want to welcome those who are tuning into the program live or on replay podcast through the email sign up. As well as this week, we have several talks. Uh, we go tomorrow or uh, Monday night. Monday, we have two talks in West Bend. One is on growing in straw bales, right? Is it no, the, no, uh, first root, is root crops. Root crops at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m. And then at 7 p.m., we're going to talk about growing in straw bales. As well as on Tuesday, we will be in Campbellsport. That's a little farther north. They invited us up there to talk about. Uh, Growing uh, in straw bales as well, and then Wednesday or Thursday at se- uh, Campbellsport is at 7:30. Uh, Thursday, ten common problems you'll face in your vegetable garden and how to solve them at Brookfield Community Library at seven o'clock. That's the third of three talks that we will conclude our series there at the Brookfield Community Library. And if you want to find out where we will be at or where you might be at, you can find that under the Come See Us tab at the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. We still have a, a handful of talks uh, locally here that we will be uh, – uh, it's all, all free that you can come learn from. Well, uh, if you have a talk that you want us to do at your particular place, you can contact us under the comes or the uh, Speaking Request tab. Well, with that being said, we are going to talk about today the importance – of birds in the garden. There is a number of benefits to why you would want to have birds come in your garden. Many people uh, believe that you don't want to have birds in your garden because they're going to destroy the plants. They're going to eat the the foliage, uh, all of that kind of thing. And that's simply not the case. No, birds are definitely very beneficial to your garden. Uh, one is, is that we talk about this, is that they will eat bad bugs. So... They, they will eat those bad bugs, and there's many different articles online about this, about what bugs they eat. One is, for us, the tomato hornworm. We've heard of them eating different squash bugs or potato bugs. So definitely, um, that's a good reason to invite yeah, them in. Yeah, they're, gonna eat the, the, they're not going to eat good bugs. Nature has designed this food chain to where they will eat the bad bugs. But the, but the robins will eat your worms. Well, yeah. yeah right. but, 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 yeah. You want, but for the most part, the birds will eat the bad bugs. And, and if they get a few worms, that, that's quite all right. They're going to be- have a lot of benefit in the garden. So uh, bug control. You don't have to use insecticides or pesticides or organic means. Uh, a lot of times, and we have found this, like you said, with the tomato hornworm, that eliminates, it, it reduces the problem by like 95% of the problems that you're going to face in your garden. 
Now, oh. yeah, so now some of them do eat weed seeds, so that's that'll help if they're eating those seeds. If you let the plant, if, if you, you let, let yeah. yeah. If, if your plants get to that point, and we're not perfect, we and, are and, plants. And, and like we talked about, it, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we, well, that maybe was in a garden talk. We leave some weeds strategically in the garden. We don't have it a pure weed-free garden because some of these weeds attract the bad bugs like uh, aphids. They will attract themselves to the weeds and not the vegetables in which we're trying to grow. And we have photographs of black aphids loaded on thistles and the plants next to it that we are actually trying to grow for food, not even touched. Right. So definitely if you see that you have some weeds that are a little overgrown, you see birds eating on them or aphids eating on them, just let them be because you're uh, you're feeding that wildlife and they're not bothering your plants. And if they're birds eating on them, then hopefully they're eating the bugs too. Now people will say, I don't want birds in my garden because they're pecking holes in my tomatoes when right before they get ripe or as they're ripe. So now i got tomatoes with a bunch we're of gonna, holes in them. We're going to cover that in just a second. Okay. We're going to yeah. talk about the more benefits. Another one is flower pollination. A lot of these birds, most commonly is known as hummingbirds, but a lot of them help in, induce flower pop, uh, pollination. They also... Um, because they're kind of, if they're landing on the plant, shaking up the plants, they're, they're giving that plant some life, which is making it pow- yeah, agitating, uh, agitating the flower, which yeah. some of these flowers, like tomatoes, have the male and female reproductive organs in the same flower. So by disturbing it, when the birds, uh, uh, insects, bugs crawling on it, it agitates or vibrates that and drops the pollen into the correct location for the fruit to, uh, p- uh d- develop. Right. So that's definitely, um, a good a good benefit. Now, here's some benefits, not just for your garden, but for you. One is that you interact with wildlife. You, if you have kids, maybe yourself, you can watch the birds. Yeah, let's, you let's can define that. Not go out and have them land on your arm like a scarecrow, <laughs> or like like Mary Poppins or yeah, something. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> you don't know. You could somebody could train a bird in their backyard. Don't tell people what to do okay. in their free time. So. Um, yeah, so you interact with the wildlife. Maybe if you want to learn their migratory patterns or do some research, you could have a whole new hobby stem of the birds in your backyard. Well, and and we talk about you know we're gonna, that that's one way. How do we bring these birds in? Let's talk about the, the, how do we get them into our garden. If we, I, do, I just want to notate real yeah, quick yeah. that it is also stress relief to watch the birds. That is scientifically, it's been scientifically proven. proven that if you sit in your backyard, you hear the the songbirds, watch the birds do their thing, it's it's a nice relaxing portion um, of your day and for you, and it's scientifically proven that does help relieve stress. Okay. Well, how do we get these birds in our garden then? Well, you have to invite them in. You have to give them a reason to come to your garden. An evite? Is that how we... (laughs) No. No, no. No, they don't have... They don't have email. They have uh, airmail. Okay. Yeah. So, um... You think that was no, funny? No, no. Okay, fine. Um, so you want to provide habitat. Birds obviously like to grow... Or grow. They like to live in in trees or enclosed areas, maybe a birdhouse. Um, maybe you could look up some plants that are good for birds, things like that. Um, but otherwise, definitely food. So if you, not all birds eat seed. We've, we learned this recently. There was this thing going around on social media about how the robins are, need to be fed because they're. During that snowstorm. A during that snowstorm yeah, because uh-huh. our, our, of our delayed spring. And robins don't eat seed. They eat worms and they eat fruits and berries okay so it's not necessarily just seed it's also other things and, and incorporating like we talked about the tomatoes being poked holes in uh they're looking for moisture if you're doing if that is occurring in your garden you they're wanting something to drink uh so you can incorporate a bird bath or simply just make it a very simple little tub or bucket with water they will find this i mean you don't, they have ponds that these birds go to, so it's not like a special little, they walk up to the edge of the pond or lake and drink and then they fly away. Some of them actually land in the water and, and that type of thing. So it doesn't have to be an elaborate, simple, functional. That's all it needs right, to be. Right, yeah. You could just, you know, make a little bird bath or something. They do want that water as well. Now, when we feed the birds, you want to put that bird feeder or bird feeders in the center of your garden. So they physically have to fly into the center to feed off those seeds, and then they can their eyesight will pick up the bad bugs. Now, bird feeder, you can have that mount on a pole. You can simply do a stake with a tuna can uh, nailed to the top of it and put bird seed in that. You want to poke some holes in the bottom of that tuna can so moisture can drain out of it during rain. But that we do that. We've got like four or five of them now, plus a bird feeder in the center of the garden. So they physically fly into the center, not the edge or the perimeter, 
so they can and then birds are very smart animals they find food they'll tell their friends hey there's something over here come come over here and they'll migrate over there so it's not just you know that they they learn how to adapt and help each other survive All right so just like us they need a place to stay they need food they need water um definitely are all are all good things to to keep the birds in the garden well what kind of birds can we in, uh, expect if we do these things and maybe you already have birds in your gar- garden already and you want to keep them there. These are other ways to, in order to do that. What are some birds that we can be familiar with seeing visit our garden? So in Wisconsin, you're definitely going to see robins. And then you'll see anything from cardinals to um, sparrows, chickadees, uh, something called a blue creeper or brown creeper, a warbler, wrens, blue jays, songbirds. All, all sorts of little birds. Now, and that's that's where that hobby could come in. You could try to figure out what kind of birds are coming to your garden. Maybe if you want to attract different birds, what what would attract them? Right, and a specific seed or food attracts specific birds of the, that type of uh, caliber into doing that. Because, yeah, some people who are bird watchers, they have a, a book in which they check off, okay, mm-hmm. I've seen this bird, I've seen this bird. So it's like coin collecting for them. They, they identify and they mark off the date and location in which they, they see that bird. But, again... People indicate, you know, oh, I, I don't want birds in my garden. Well, that birds are part of nature. Birds are very beneficial to that. It's just like your garden. Not many people think about this, or some people do think about this. Your garden is an ecosystem. It's a it's a little community within itself, and birds are part of that ecosystem. And you want to you want to, them to strive and live within your little happy backyard garden. Absolutely. Well, when we come back, we are going to discuss plants, perennial plants, that are going to feed yourself and make minimal amount of work for you through the years to come, right after this. Got a question? Email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. Woodman's is a Wisconsin-based family-owned company founded in 1919. They offer low prices in every single aisle every day. No need to carry a discount card. From produce to meat to international to natural and organic, all offered at the lowest possible prices. Over 60,000 products at every store. Service and savings every day. They're employee-owned to help you save money. They also offer online shopping for pickup and delivery, working to save you more money. Visit woodmans-food.com to find the nearest location. Keep your garden growing and your grass green with a Chapin G362D Professional Hose and Sprayer. Easily fertilize your lawn and garden and control pests. Just fill the tank with solution, select a mixing ratio, attach a garden hose, and spray. One 32-ounce tank will spray up to 362 gallons of diluted concentrate. Find online or order through Lowe's, Home Depot, Do It Best Hardware. See the full line of Chapin products at www.chapinmfg.com. The Tree Diaper is an advanced plant hydration system. It is an innovative device that captures and holds the water around your plants once full and hydrates them slowly when the plants need it over a period of 30 days. From half to 30 gallon capacity based on your needs. And easy to install even for a first time gardener. The Tree Diaper reduces weeds, protects plants, enhances root growth, and prevents overwatering. Whether you're growing trees, vegetables, flowers, house plants, in containers, or the ground, your plants will benefit greatly by allowing the Tree Diaper to do the work for you. Find out more at TreeDiaper.com. Made in the USA. Paul Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunk. Find out more at TallEarth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at TallEarth.com. Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Honey Forever, this garden fun fact is sponsored by Minerti.com. Get your three pack today. Drop the tea bag in water, let steep, then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at Minerti.com. Always free shipping. True honey stored in airtight containers never spoils. Sealed honey in vats have been found in King Tut's tomb that contains edible honey despite being 2,000 years old. Honey also has the ability to attract and absorb moisture, which makes it remarkably soothing for miter burns and helps prevent scabbing. 
An Oya is an unglazed, porous clay pot with a short neck and a wider belly. Bury your Oya neck deep in your raised bed, container, or ground garden and let the Oya do your watering by releasing water as needed. How? By soil moisture tension for all you techies out there. This is an eco-friendly, efficient, ancient way to water your plants using up to 70% less water than other irrigation methods. It saves you time and is easy to install. Find a retailer through drippingspringsoyas.com. Smart watering, easy gardening. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Fling Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bobex, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. You didn't mention that I was a sailboat trailer expert. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're coming here, and there was this trailer, and I didn't know what it was. And I said, oh, that's a sailboat trailer, which I didn't know that you had any knowledge of sailboat expertise whatsoever. Well, I've grown up by water my whole life, okay. so well, I know things. Well, I know tractors, so there you go. Okay. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Sometimes when it comes to uh, gardening, you want to grow plants that actually work for you, that you do not have to do a whole lot of maintenance. And we're going to go over a list of perennial fruits and vegetables that can do this. Now, with any plant, there is a minor amount of work that needs to go into this. But these are plants that will live multiple years and feed you with, really, you don't have to go plant it every year and that type of thing. So uh, let's let's talk about asparagus for being one. This is the asparagus time of year. We talked about it with Greg Keyes a couple of weeks ago about planting it. Asparagus can last 20 to 50 years. Uh, you need uh, the disclaimer on all these are ex- all but one, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, we'll talk about that. All of these, you have to give a certain amount of time in order for these things to get mature. Right, that's just it, is that this is a commitment. So it's not something that if you want something instantaneous and... Farmer's well, market, yeah. <laughs> Farmer's market. Uh, Woodman, yeah. outpost, beans and barley, yeah, go buy go, it there. Yeah, go buy it there. But definitely um, these are plants that are going to take a little bit of time. So asparagus, there's a few ways you can grow it. You can buy a one-year crown or two year crown, or you can start it from seed. After the third year is when you're going to get that harvest. You don't want to harvest the fronds or the, the growth, uh, spears, 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 uh, until they're at least the diameter of a number two pencil. Right. So if, if you, if you see the, the asparagus coming up, maybe you planted it last year and you get excited, you're like, oh, I have asparagus now, just, and it's tiny, it's spindly, let it go, wait till next year. And, uh, sometimes you can intercrop in those patches of asparagus with tomatoes those are the, what is recommended if you're going to grow something additionally in that spot to utilize the space more effectively uh, rhubarb is another plant that can live up to 15 years you will have to divide this uh, we can do it in the ground or containers but it that third year is that key of when you're going to be able to get good stalks or uh, you don't want to eat the leaves the leaves are toxic the stalks is what you're wanting to do right uh, on them a lot of people like rhubarb and want to grow it so that's definitely something that's going to come back year after year now just because we name these off just don't go to blue mills or your garden center and buy it find out if you even like this stuff first before you commit to planting it and the effort and going into it uh like i talk at at our garden talks we get questions and, and we've had questions about for example, how do I grow okra? Well, do you like okra? Not really. Well, then why are you growing it? Eh, not really sure. So you want to make sure you know that you like this stuff. Buy it at the store. It's not going to have that out-of-the-garden flavor, but it's going to give you an, an idea of if you even want to attempt to put it in your garden. Right. So then we have the Jerusalem artichokes or the or the sunchokes. This is something that you can plant now. Get the, the, get the tubers online 
and you're going to have a harvest by October. This is the exception to all of these. Right, yeah. This is more of an instant gratification perennial plant. However, however, um, it could be invasive. So um, it will spread. And so if you if you are like, I'm not sure about this. What if I don't like it? I have these tubers. Whatever. You might want to just try to grow it in a container first. Raised bed container. Uh, we've got a designated... Uh, 50 square foot area in the garden where that's where it's always going to be now till the end of time. Now, each plant can produce between 4 and 15 pounds of, of these tubers, and uh, the plant actually can get 8 to 15 foot tall. And it's related to the daisy and the sunflower. It does put on small daisy-like uh, flowers uh, later on in the season, uh, and it does grow very well it's here. Very, they're very pretty flowers. So... It's uh, kind of a beneficial plant in that way, too, that they are very pretty flowers. And we've grown them in, in all forms and fashions. So, uh, And we had a big one behind the compost pile, which we didn't know where that came from, that produced <laughs> about eight pounds of I think of we planted a container there. I, I, I don't possibly. know. Possibly. Um, so the walking Egyptian onions, or the Egyptian walking onions, they are onions. They're a spring onion. You would plant them in the spring. Um, they're going to grow a top set or a top bulb. And what happens is that that top bulb falls, falls over and then it plants itself. And you harvest the roots. So it's like, that's why they call them the walking onions because it basically plants itself, but it falls over. So it kind of is like it's walking. Yeah, as it grows, tips over, roots. Another plant grows up, falls over, and it'll progressively work. Yeah. Across. If untouched, it will comp- it'll walk across the field right. essentially. Yeah. yeah. So that's why they're called that. But that is something you won't get the it won't get the top bulb the first year. So we would actually leave them the first year. It, they're just them. like regular onions, the biennials. Right. And then seeds second in the second year. year, you could get that harvest. Um, horseradish. I'm not sure if you. I don't think. I think you can harvest your first year. It's kind of a. It's a root crop. It's mm-hmm. kind of a. You, you, you'll harvest it, and it looks like parsley. But it has this uh, immense Now, aroma. you can eat it just like you would a carrot. The, the horseradish intensity doesn't occur until you actually grind it or shred it because then it oxidizes, and that's where that intensity of flavor comes from that we're familiar with what horseradish is uh, known for. But it will grow down just like carrots underground. It looks like a weed. If you did not know what it was, you would just assume it's a weed and you're just going to cut it off and and kill it or mow it over, that type of thing. It has big, uh, broad leaves on it, and it can last upwards of 15 years. And you can divide it, too. You can take those chunks or carrot-like item uh, roots and move it to a different location. Not recommended for containers because it really does grow very deep. You just want good, rich soil. Uh, even they'll grow in poor soil. Jerusalem artichokes will pour, grow in poor soil, too. Um, that's that's the benefit to those. Yeah, definitely. They It's... um. I don't want to say it's an aggressive root, but it definitely, it will grow in some some bad soil. Um, and th- so then that that's definitely one you can... And that's, there's, there, that's some of the multiple vegetables. That, now, these are the most common ones. Now, if you live in a warmer area, you can grow kale year-round. We had kale that one year that grew um, up until like December or so, because kale is a hardy plant once it's established. Right, right. So those are the vegetables uh, and root crops. Let's talk about some fruit and berry uh, items here in which can be that long-term commitment but produce year after year with minimal amount of work. I want to talk about strawberries really quick because we get a lot of questions yes. about this. People want to start a strawberry patch. They don't They don't quite know if that's something they want to do. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there that you can grow in containers, that you can grow off the side of your straw bell, or you see these really cute strawberry planters at you know the garden center and you're like, oh, that's cute, but... It's not. It's not really like that. Strawberries are. They need a, a more permanent home, definitely. And, and they're going to produce based on your variety, either June bearing or ever bearing, two to four weeks a year. And you're going to have to maintain them. If they're in a container, you're going to have to continually water them. We have them established in the ground in a 150 square foot area. Our patch is now going on eight years old, so it's it's about its life's about over five to seven is about your max, on these. Uh, but if you're if you want to grow strawberries, just go to the pick your own farm. Very affordable. You can get more berries than you know what to do with, or the farmers market. It, if it's not something that is beneficial to plant three or four plants in a container and try to maintain 50, 48 weeks a year to to benefit you, that was four weeks to get something a few berries off them. That's that's our professional opinion on that. You can do what you want, but that's we don't see put something in its spot other than strawberries. Uh, or I put a tomato in that spot to get 20 pounds of tomatoes versus 
six, eight ounces of strawberries over a growing season, you know. So that's, that's that. Most fruit trees and nut trees are three to seven years before they will actually produce, uh, on, on that. So let's go to the Ivy Organics 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline. We have a question. Caller, you are on the air. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, so happy to be on the air with you both top of the morning to both of you again. And good morning, Milwaukee. And good morning, Mr. Debo. Um, um, speaking of the edibles, um, I, I, I'm in a, um, a neighborhood here where I'm surrounded by uh, the berries, and I noticed that um, every once in a while when they start to turn, you know, either burgundy or purple there, I'll go ahead and pick some and eat them. But uh, I've got walnuts in the neighborhood, and I, I notice a lot of these people are just letting a lot of this stuff go to waste. I sometimes I'll bowl some up, you know, but um, the, the the walnuts I've got I, I can point out b- about three walnut trees, and I just notice a lot of this stuff going to waste. So I'm just hoping that um, a lot of people will, you know, uh, that are familiar with a lot of these things up, uh, and a lot of this stuff is just growing like you know, right right off of backyards and stuff that are just you know just growing wild, and they just let it fall to the you know the birds will get some, the squirrels may get some, but it just I just see it just hits the ground and goes to waste, you know. Absolutely. I I can't, I can't eat it all, but I'll try and get some of it, you know. Right. And, yeah, that, yeah. and that's the thing. A lot of these places, they, oh, it's a pear tree, oh, whatever. Yeah, this, right. This stuff's yeah. edible. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, uh, I got a couple of the pear trees and in, in, uh, surrounding uh, areas as well. But uh, a lot of these berries, I guess raspberries, raspberries, possibly blueberries even, uh, more so raspberries, but uh, the, the 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 raspberries and the uh, walnuts. I see a lot of that stuff going to waste. And until a couple of years ago, I, I see these. I said, "What is it?" And it actually was a walnut, you know, because uh, down in Oklahoma, well, my dad and his um, side of the family, they pe- pecans and walnuts. So I should have knew, you know, you know what a pecan looks like. But the walnuts, I I, I would have never known that uh, walnuts were grown way up here. So, but I see a lot of the wild walnuts being grown in, you know, the, the local Milwaukee area. So thank you very much. Have a great day and wonderful show. Thank you. Love you both. Thank, thank, you, thank you very you. much thank for you listening. For thank, thank you for calling. For, yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, a lot of these, you, you want to be, you, know, you may have this stuff in your neighborhood. One, you want to properly identify it. And two, then if it all is on somebody's property in which uh, they're not accessing it, or maybe they are, because, our, you know, pear trees produce a lot of pears, nuts trees produce a lot of nuts you can go hey you know do you mind if we kind of you know i'll I'll can this up for you or whatever the case is i just don't let it go to waste it's money being thrown on the ground essentially nature's giving us to you right Uh, especially if it's right by the sidewalk or something and you want to you know see if or if it's hanging over the sidewalk you can always knock on their door and say hey can i can i harvest some of this a lot of times they're going to say yeah go ahead they're going to say yeah yeah so, again, nut trees, fruit trees, about three to seven years minimum before they will produce. But, there, again, there's a lot in the in the city here that are, are producing yearly. Well, when we come back, Michelle Balls will be with us. She is the author of Composting for a New Generation. We're going to talk all about composting and how you don't need a giant compost pile in order to produce compost right after this. Twenty four seven three sixty five. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com has all the gardening information you need. Videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants, will not wash off, and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more, visit BobX.com. B O B B. BEX.COM. Eco Garden Systems is a revolutionary way to grow food, a fully contained raised platform with a conventional watering system, solar power unit optional. Made from recycled material in the U.S., Eco Garden Systems raised garden bed offers sustainable organic gardening that is environmentally sound, quick and easy to set up, maintain, and fun to use. Fill your garden with soil and plant your seeds. Your Eco Garden will take care of the rest, can set up in backyard, patio, and even your driveway. 
driveway, any level surface. For more information, visit EcoGardenSystems.com. Use coupon code WIVEG125 to save $125 and get free shipping. A $250 value on the purchase of an Eco Garden Original Garden Unit available only in stone color. Purchases must be made to the website EcoGardenSystems.com forward slash store. Offer valid through December 31st, 2018. Available to the contiguous United States. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian Specialties, 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at zazproducts.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at rebelgreen.com. Flame Engineering, home of the Weed Dragon, the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use. For killing weeds, no need to pull or spray. 100 other uses. Find out more at flameengineering.com. Hostels wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. House Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at HossTools.com. I know you're looking for an alternative to harsh chemicals, but you want professional strength props. BioSafe's Garden Line gives you just that. Professionally used for 20 years, available to homeowners. Organic solutions that are effective. They offer an array of eco-friendly products from plant food, fertilizer, to one-of-a-kind herbicides, organic weed killer. BioSafe's products can be used around children, pets, wildlife, so you can enjoy your yard more. Grow stronger, healthier with BioSafe. Find us on Facebook at BioSafe home and garden and visit us at biosafe.net to learn more get 10 percent off your next purchase at biosafe.net by using coupon code twvg at checkout the number one key to healthy productive plants are the roots starting from seed to full-grown plants rootmaker.com has the answer from seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots creating a fabulous root system Never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Rootmaker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. So, just uh, want to talk about next week. We're going to be at the Blue Mills Spring Kickoff Party. So, there's going to be a lot of things going on. Um, they're going to have an open house where you can take a look at the plant selection. So, they're they're all gearing up ready for spring. I was there yesterday, and they got all their a lot of their vegetable starts in already uh, yesterday morning. And then they're going to be relaunching their annual Blue Mill Bucks program. So, it's time for that. So, for every ten dollars you spend, you get one Blue Mill Buck for the to. To bring them back, to bring back and spend later. The following week. Yeah, the, or whenever. Yeah. Um, prize drawings, and then the Long Garden Specialists. Um, this is all on May 5th, which is next Saturday. From 11 to 2, and we will be there from 11 to probably about 1. Uh, we will be there. You can meet us. We'll have our big sign out there. you got garden questions. You want to sign up for a weekly email, you can certainly do that. And where is Blue Mills, Joey? 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. Uh, they can supply and surpass all of your needs. Uh, you can find more information at bluemills.com, or you can always call them at 414-282-4220. Their spring kickoff next Saturday morning, 11 to 2, uh, May 5th. 
Well, Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics uh, 3 in 1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Michelle Balls is a longtime backyard composter with a passion for reducing our impact on the planet. She spends her days writing laid back advice for home composters in the Confessions of a Composter blog, teaching classes on backyard composting, learn everything she can about composting, recycling, reusing, and waste reduction. She has a new book out, Composting for a New Generation, Latest Techniques for the Bin and Beyond. Welcome to the program, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Well, we're so glad you've taken time out of your day to teach all of us a little bit more about composting because it's a very confusing topic when it comes to to home gardeners uh, that we have found. Well, it shouldn't be. It's it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. There's a few basic concepts, but after that, then it, you know, it's smooth sailing. I think a lot of people have misconceptions about composting. They've heard things, you know, that might not be accurate, or they have friends or family members who are like, what are you doing in your backyard? (laughs) So what is the biggest misconception about composting? I would say most, the biggest misconception is that it's going to smell and that it's difficult to do. And um, as far as it being difficult to do, as once you get a few basic concepts down, it's actually super easy to do. It takes very little time out of your day. Um, and then the the smell, all you really have to do is make sure it's well balanced and that your material is covered and you will have no smell. So let's talk about that smell. There's anaerobic and aerobic compost piles. Which is the one that we should be having? Very good question. So aerobic is what you should have. And what that means is that you work air into the pile. So when it goes anaerobic, that's when you get that that kind of balance smell. It smells a little bit like a swamp. Um, that means that there's not enough air in there. And then the bacteria that have grown into your pile are the anaerobic bacteria. So the, it will decompose, but it decomposes much more slowly. And it also creates that smell. So when if you're able to work air into your pile, then you're not going to get those anaerobic bacteria. Okay. So um, what what is the ideal recipe for a simple backyard compost Something that maybe people just, you know, they work full time, have other things going on. They don't want to, um, you know, so they're thinking about size and they're also thinking Mm -hmm. about what's what's the best stuff to add to it. Yeah, so the the basic size that you want is at least three foot by three foot. If you buy a plastic bin at the store, then then you're set. They've already figured out what size you need. Um, And as far as the balance, the recipe, you want to put for every one part of kitchen scraps, or fresh material, like fresh cut grass that you put in your pile, you want about three parts of of dry, dead leaves or brown material, shredded newspaper if you don't have leaves. Um, You need to balance that one part green to three parts brown, and that's really the best recipe. Well, let's talk about uh, having problems with the compost uh, pile. What what are some problems that people have? One, is it putting the wrong stuff in the pile? And two, I would Mm -hmm. expect it being rodents or animals digging in that pile. That's very true. So you want to make sure that you're only composting fruit and vegetable scraps. Don't want to put meat or cheese, dairy, any kind of dairy, because that is going to create an odor that will attract rodents and and those kinds of um, animals. Um, And it also will create that smell. It's just, you know, meat decaying does not smell good. So you want to keep that out of your backyard. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you are burying your food scraps every time you put it in. And that does a couple things. It, it helps balance, like I was talking about earlier, but then it also um, keeps any odors out so that the critters aren't attracted to your bin. And then it also keeps fruit flies out. So we bring fruit flies home on our vegetables from the um, supermarket, and then um, they, they will start growing. So if you bury those food scraps, they will not burrow down into the pile so then you, you won't have the fruit size problem. Uh, th- but there are some flies that are good for the pile, isn't it? Aren't there? Oh, absolutely. So the, um, you know, the, the baby sage of the, the flies, otherwise known as maggots, um, those, there are some flies, uh, black soldier flies in particular, where they're actually, that's a, that's a great decomposer for your pile. Um, and the black soldier flies are not the annoying kind of flies. They're going to fly around your head. Um, they pretty much will leave you alone. So there are some flies that are okay, um, but mostly you're looking at um, other ki- um, types of uh, macroinvertebrates that are going to be eating your materials. Well, we'll, we'll talk about vermicomposting in a moment, but I want to talk about people who don't have that ability to have that three-foot by three-foot square-foot 
be- a bo- a box in the backyard. There is a mm-hmm. method uh, called trench or pit composting. Explain those methods and the benefits that they might have versus a pile. Yeah, so I have a whole chapter in the book about integrating composting into your garden, and those pit and trench composts are one of those ways to do it. And this, I mean, the concept is super simple. You just dig a hole deep enough that you're burying your food scraps. You bury your food scraps, you put some leaves in there, and then you cover it up. Um, so that's what a pit composting is. And there are people that do that, especially if they have a garden bed that is really poor soil and they're not planning on planting anything there. They just want to work a little while on amending that soil. That's a good way to do that. Um, the trench composting is very similar to a pit, but you're digging a trench, right? Um, and, and one really good method of doing that is if you have garden rows, you can have your composting trench on one of the rows that you're not planting because it does, that as that material is decomposing, it does take nitrogen a little bit out of the soil around it. So you don't want to be planting right on top of that, but it is one way to, to amend your soil slowly and, um, and, and it's a pretty easy way to compost because once the material is decomposed, it's right there in your ground. You don't have to harvest it. Okay. Now, sometimes people will hear the word um, vermicomposting or vermiposting and are not, you know, quite familiar with what that is. What is something that, or could you explain that briefly, what that is? Absolutely. So vermicomposting is composting with worms. It's composting with a very specific type of worm um, called red wigglers. And um, you have to, so you have to buy those special. You can't just go into your backyard and grab some worms and put them in a bin. But you build this bin. The, ver- the red wigglers, they are leaf litter um, worms that like to be in that kind of material. So the, the earthworms in your backyard like to dig, dig down really deep into the soil. These guys don't. And they can eat half their body weight in food scraps a day. So if you have a pound of worms, you can put a half a pound of food scraps in that bin a day. And the material you get out of it, the vermicompost, is some of the highest quality material compost that you can make. Um, and if you look up online at, like, buying some vermicastings or vermicompost, you'll see that it's actually quite valuable. Now, with that vermicomposting, two things. One, I, I've been told you don't want to add citrus skins to that uh the, the the unit for the worms, and two that whatever device you have these worms in, they will stop stop multiplying once their box or bin is at capacity. They're not going to overpopulate themselves. Is it is it correct? That's right. Yes. So with the citrus, for some reason, citrus does not work well in a, a vermicomposting. As you can imagine, it is acidic. So it's going to change the acidity since it's such a small bin that that's a problem. But then also, I, whenever I've accidentally put a citrus peel into my vermicompost bin, I get these little tiny white flies that are attracted to that, and those are really, really annoying. So I completely avoid citrus in my vermicompost bin. Um, I'm sorry, I forget your other question. They, they won't overpopulate themselves. They'll, they'll quit whenever the, the bin is full or their That's right, full. yeah. So they, are, they self-regulate their population. So when they... Um, they'll mate and lay eggs and, and repopulate your bin as you feed them. If you feed them less, then you'll get you'll have less worms in there. And then if they fill up, if your berm, your bin fills up with vermicompost that needs to be harvested, then there's not as much uh, space for them to grow. So they you won't ever have a problem of you know an overabundance of worms. And, and that's great because you can harvest those and create another bin, uh, but you want to keep that soil moist because worms want a certain amount of moisture. Otherwise, they're going to die or, or get too wet and drowned. That's right. They basically breathe through their skin, so they, you have to keep a moist environment for them to be able to live. So let's go back outside and talk about this compost pile that we've created. Uh, there is called cold composting and there's called hot composting. Now, uh, if, if you can, we, we've talked about both of those, but I want you to, to go into more of the science of it. And is there a benefit to one versus the other, or as long as this stuff breaks down, we're in good shape? Yes, the, the age-old hot composting versus cold composting debate. Um, basically, the way I look at it is cold composting is kind of a lazy way of composting, which is perfectly fine. I mean that completely unjudgmentally. Um, so with cold composting, you don't have to put as much work into it. Um, you know, you still want to have a good balance, but you're, you don't have to turn it as often. You don't have to worry about cutting the materials down. There have been some studies that have shown you do get a, a, a nice, um, a different kind of 
uh, nutrient um, profile in finished compost that comes from cold composting versus hot composting. The benefits of hot composting are that you get finished compost much more quickly. Um, it does take more work, so you have to be out there turning the pile, making sure you're aerating it. You want to make sure that you know the leaves you put in there are shredded, that any food scraps you put in there are, are pretty finely chopped up. Um, you want to make sure you're testing the moisture level. You even um, get out there and turn it every other day sometimes, depending on what kind of method you're using. So um, hot composting definitely takes more work. You get finished compost faster. Um, but then there are benefits of cold composting, right? I mean, we're, we all are li- live busy lives, and so sometimes it's nice to just relax and do things the easy way. Excellent. Now, where can we find your book and find more about you? So um, you can buy the, the book Composting for New Generation at Lowe's, at pretty much any, um, on Amazon, pretty much any uh, bookstore. Um, I am on Instagram and Twitter as Compost Geek, if you want to follow me there and my silly stories. But, um, but yeah, you can, you can find the book pretty much anywhere books are sold. Well, Michelle, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your data to enlighten us and inform us about composting and how we can do it better in our own uh, communities. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. And we'll be back after these after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVorganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Wouldn't you love to get more from your growing space? By utilizing the square foot garden method and properly spacing your plants, Seeding Square will optimize and organize your veggie garden to grow more greens and less weeds. The square foot color-coded seed spacer is a great tool for any garden, ground, container, or raised bed, and all experience levels, even little green thumbs. For more information, visit SeedingSquare.com. Seeding Square is gardening made simple. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit Plant Success Organics. Root Assess, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at TheGardener'sHollowLeg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune, just 99 cents at MIGardener.com. Gardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Here at Outpost Natural Foods, it's not just that we're community-owned that sets us apart. It's the fabulous foods we sell. We celebrate Earth Day every day by offering our customers the finest natural and organic food selections in greater Milwaukee. Outpost local farmers and vendors provide our stores with a delicious selection of fresh seasonal produce that you won't want to miss. Outpost stores are located in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa, Bayview, and Mequon. We're a real Milwaukee original where anyone can shop and anyone can join. For the whole scoop about Outpost, we invite you to visit www.outpost.co. Co-op. 
Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for, annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts Joey and Holly Baird. We got a couple questions here, and you're always welcome to give us a call on the Ivy Organics Three in One Plant Guard Hotline if you have a question. We've got a few minutes to the top of the hour. Ivy Organic Three in One Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields prune to damage surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you can visit IvyOrganics.com. You can call in at 414-444-5250. We had a question come in. How effective is adding eggshells to your garden i know they have calcium calcium is a very beneficial it's a, a nutrient in which these plants need a way in order to ex, uh, get that more readily accessible to the plant is to dry the egg shell out you can put it in the microwave for whatever time period you want a minute or two and then grind it up to a powder then you can incorporate that into your garden hole and it's going to be much more quicker for the microbial life to break down to feed your plants rather than just crushing an eggshell throwing in the hole which can take up to 18 months to break down to a point where it's usable so dehydrate them dry them out let them sit in the sun uh, grind them up into a powder Use them that way. Right. Okay, so that's definitely good. Um, so another question is, since we're getting hopefully close to potato planting season, I have some time. I want to build a potato tower. How does this work? Is it effective? Is it something I should be doing? Uh, no. The potato tower is a device in which Pinterest took and ran with. There was a photograph on it. And the premise of it is you plant five or six seed potatoes in a 4x4 in a four four square foot area. And then as they grow, you continue to mount soil up until the potato tower is two and a half, three, four foot tall. And then you open the potato tower up and you have 100 pounds of potatoes. That's simply not the case. You find hundreds of videos online about making potato towers, but you can find minimal amount of videos online about the success of harvesting them because there are none. The potato does not continue to put roots and tubers out up the stalk as one thinks because though potatoes are part of the nightshade family, it's not like tomatoes, which on tomatoes every hair follicle can be a root. Potatoes is simply not that. Now there are determinate and indeterminate varieties of potatoes, but it's nothing that if you allow the stalk to grow nine foot, it's going to put potatoes on it all the way up the stalk. The universities have done this test, and there is no proven university extension uh, study that shows that potatoes in a potato tower are effective, so don't waste, waste your space. There are other methods that work if you layer the potato as you got multiple t- potatoes growing in towers, but not a single layer, it is not effective. So let's see here. A very helpful video. This was in response to how to grow tomatillos. Uh, thank you. This will be my very first year growing them. Again, we've got uh, 1,100 garden videos about multiple growing uh, techniques on the website, and we get a lot of comments like that in uh, multiple times a week about how beneficial it is. Another one is I want to know what potatoes are the quickest to be ready to harvest. Well, that uh, there are three categories of potatoes, early, mid, and late season. So your, mid, your early are about 70 to 90 days, your mid are 90 to 100 days, and your late are 110 to 135 days. You can start harvesting your potatoes after 10 weeks of planting them, after the flowers develop on them and, and fall off, then you can go ahead and harvest them. But uh, any of those varieties, as long as you get that, you know, after the flowers fall off, you can harvest them at that point. How do you divide your seed potatoes, and is it even necessary? Can I plant the potato whole in the ground? Would you Dividing your seed potatoes, 
typically when you get them from the garden center or online, we order and we work with Wood Prairie Farms. It's out of Bridgewater, Maine. They're a specialty family-owned farm. They have 26 specific types of uh, seed potatoes certified. You can uh, you get them, and they're be- they've already begun to sprout, and that's a good thing. It identifies where the growths are going to be on the potato. Just if you would have bought some organic potatoes from Outpost or Woodman's or Beans and Barley, and they begin to sprout in your cupboard, uh, those can be used as well because they're organic. But we'll talk about that in a different time. You're going to divide your potatoes, preferably with two sprouts per chunk. Let's say the potato has four sprouts on it. You can cut it in half and have each chunk have two sprouts coming off of it. You do not want your potato chunk to have to be any smaller than a medium-sized chicken egg. That chunk of potato that contains, in this example, two sprouts, that is the energy for those sprouts until the sprouts get large enough to develop their own root system and detach from that chunk of potato. That is why when you dig potatoes up, you'll sometimes find that mushy, rotted-looking chunk of potato. That's that seed potato has been detached. You do not have to cut your potatoes. Uh, if you have a very large seed potato, you can get three, four chunks off of it. You're going to extend your seed stalk. So instead of having one potato, now you have potentially three or four potatoes that you can plant uh, in the row. So you're just expanding it. Whether you do it plant the whole potato or a chunk of potato, the the yield from some of these university studies have shown that it's going to be the same. You're just extending that seed stock. So you don't have to, but you can get a few more potatoes and make another row essentially out of what you already uh, have bought or you've gotten from the the garden center. Uh, Marilyn asked, I uh, I need a way to keep tomato hornworms from eating my tomatoes. This is a problem. Well, uh, Tomato hornworms, if you do not know if you have them, you will know the symptoms or the results. It's like you're going to harvest the tomato tomorrow morning, you come out, uh, and you leave it tonight for tomorrow morning, and the tomato has basically been ate all around the core and there's some black droppings left, or, and, or the leaves have been ate off your plant. This is the tomato hornworm, and these, that is the symptoms. So, one, you can harvest your tomatoes a little earlier. Two, there, you can apply BT. Uh, it's a liquid or powder form. It's a naturally occurring bacteria in nature. You do have to reapply that after rains uh, to allow these insects to ingest that. Uh, like we talked about in the first segment, bring birds in, and they will pick off the insects, the good, uh, the, the bad bugs, the worms, all of that, off your plants. Uh, you can also not plant in that same area that you planted last year. Move it 5, 10 feet away, if, if all possible. Disturb that soil right now in the spring or in the fall. That disrupts the cocoon in which that larva is living in under the soil. And you will, it looks like a monarch butterfly cocoon if you're able to find it. You want to dispose of it, step on it, break it up, and... Um, You'll, not, you'll reduce your chances by 90%, whether you use a spade, a shovel, a garden fork, or a tiller. Disturb that soil where that, that problem was last year and move the plants to a different location. And that will help immensely. Mary asks, I have a vegetable-only compost bin. I've been putting crushed eggshells on it. My question is, I've been trying to remove the skins from the eggshells with very limited success after rinsing and drying the shells. Is this necessary? Not at all. You can dry your shells in the microwave or just let them set out, crush them, put them on your compost pile. Uh, You can also grind them up to a powder and use them in the planting hole of your vegetables, and that will make the calcium even more readily available. Well, we are out of time, and we appreciate yours. We love whenever you join us each Saturday morning on the program. Join us next week as we will discuss mulch, the importance of it, how to use it, and what's the best mulch to use, as well as five tips for container gardens. Some people, that's all you're able to do is grow in containers, so we're going to go over the five tips that will help your container garden thrive, as well as chicken expert Melissa Colfrey will be with us to talk about if you are able or want to have chickens in your backyard, as long as you follow the municipality laws in your township, 
We'll go over that. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in full-length in-studio video as well as podcast form. Want a specific interview or certain topic? You can find it underneath the highlight tab on the right-hand side, both containing full Season 1 and Season 2 as they're added. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You have been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joy and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcasting, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.